What's going on all of my healthcare professionals? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. We're continuing on with our cardiovascular assessment and electrocardiogram like a boss series. And today we're gonna to be looking at some of our sinus rhythms. Before we begin, I want you to take a look up here on the right side of your screen. You're gonna see two different sets of stoplights. Our first set of stoplight is gonna tell us about our rhythm. Is it a good rhythm? Is it a rhythm we should be cautious about? Or is it a lethal rhythm, that those not really good rhythms? And our next one is gonna be either a green person letting us know that we can play our monopoly game, collect our $200 and keep going, or it needs to be red, stop, we need to do something about this before it gets worse. So to begin, let's look at our first rhythm. We have our sinus rhythm, our normal sinus rhythm. The rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. The rhythm is regular and it is initiated by that sinoatrial node. P waves are regular and they always precede each QRS complex. Our PR interval is normal, 0.12 to 0.2 seconds, and our QRS interval is less than 0.12 seconds, which is also normal. Normal sinus rhythms are normal, so there's not really an intervention that we need to do for this, so we can continue on with our next rhythm. So let's talk about sinus bradycardia. So the rate of sinus bradycardia is less than 60 beats per minute. Bradycardia less than 60. The rhythm is regular and is initiated by our sinoatrial node. And P waves are normal and upright. The PR interval lengthens as the rate decreases. So that's something new that you're gonna see. And our QRS interval is less than 0.12 seconds. That's normal. Now, in a well-conditioned individual, such as like an athlete, this is considered a normal rhythm. And we don't do much for this unless the patient becomes symptomatic. So some causes for this rhythm that you're gonna see could be hypoxemia, myocardial infarction, you could have a sick sinus syndrome, which would cause bradycardia, um, hyperkalemia, hypothyroidism, congestive heart failure, uh, medication side effects such as your beta blockers, digitalis, your calcium channel blockers. Um, patients can become syncopal, they could pass out. Hypertension, increased intracranial pressure can cause um, differenti differentiation between our um, rhythms and our hemodynamics, as well as patients that are at rest, this could be normal. So what do we do for this rhythm? We really don't do much for it. We monitor it um, unless this patient starts to become symptomatic, then this becomes more of a cautious rhythm. So if the patient is symptomatic, there's a few choices that we can do. We could do atropine, we can start transcutaneous pacing, we can give them dopamine or epinephrine. So let's go over what each of those are. To begin, we have atropine. That is our first drug of choice for symptomatic sinus bradycardias. It can also be used in our AV nodal blocks. However, there really hasn't been shown any benefit to our second degree type two heart blocks as well as our third degree complete heart blocks. You may still see it, but it just might not show benefit. So atropine dosing, 0.5 milligrams IV every three to five minutes not to exceed 0.04 milligrams per kilogram with a maximum of three milligrams. Considerations for atropine, it can cause myocardial oxygen demand, so we have to be cautious if there is myocardial ischemia or hypoxia present when providing this to our patients. Lastly, it's important to note that atropine can cause paradoxal slowing. So sometimes instead of bringing the heart rate up, it can actually make it worse and slow it down further. So we need to prepare to pace these patients in case that paradoxal slowing does occur. Talking about transcutaneous pacing, this is not fun for our patients, especially our conscious patients. So for unstable bradycardias that are less than 50 beats per minute with some kind of compromised hemodynamics, so what is that? That could be hypotension, acute altered mental status changes, shock, ischemic chest discomfort, as well as our acute heart failure patients. So what do we usually pace when we do transcutaneous pacing? Well, we do our symptomatic sinus node dysfunction rhythms, our type two second degree heart blocks, our third degree heart blocks, complete heart blocks, our new bundle branch patients that sh are showing slowing, as well as um, we're not using this for our agonal rhythms or our cardiac arrest. It shows no benefits. Cardiopulmonary CPR, if it's shockable, we're gonna shock. If not, um, 
we're just going to give medications and provide CPR. So transcutaneous precautions. Conscious paced patients may require analgesia for that pacing discomfort. Remember, this is uncomfortable for our patients when they're awake because they're constantly being shocked to provide that rhythm, um, to provide that upping of that rhythm for that patient. We also want to avoid palpating carotid pulses to confirm capture. Why do we do that? Because electrical impulses can cause muscle jerking that can mimic a pulse. So if you're checking a carotid pulse, that might not be accurate because of that constant muscle jerking caused by the transcutaneous pacing. So how do we set it up? We're going to position the pacing pads on the patient as instructed by the packaging. Normally one pad goes over the right anterior chest wall and then the left pad will go on the left midaxillary line next to the heart. We want to turn on the pacer before we do anything else. And we want to set the demand rate to 80 beats per minute or whatever the physician tells you to set it to. We also want to set the current MA output. So an increased current starting with a minimum setting and moving on until electrical capture is consistent, which would be a wide QRS and a T wave after each pacer spike, that means that our patient has ventricular pace, would be something that we want to see. Common current ranges between 50 to 80 MAs. Let's talk about that good old boy dopamine. This is our second drug of choice for symptomatic sinus bradycardia. It's mostly used for our hypotensive patients who have a systolic less than 100 that are also showing signs and symptoms of shock. Something that is very important to note specifically with dopamine is we don't give this medication IV push. Please, please, please never push this medication. It's always given via IV infusion. So dopamine dosing rates initially will be between 2 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And we titrate based on the patient's hemodynamics, their blood pressure. Normally we're looking for a systolic rate of greater than 90. Considerations when it comes to dopamine include the fact that we need to correct hypovolemia with adequate fluid replacement prior to starting dopamine. Because this is an IV fusion and not an IV push, we need to make sure that the patient has the adequate volume to move this medication around. We also want to use it cautiously with our cardiogenic patients, especially our CHF patients. And we need to note that it may cause tachyarrhythmias and excessive vasoconstriction. So we have to be very careful when we're titrating this medication. Lastly, you don't want to mix this medication with sodium bicarbonate because the fact is sodium bicarb is a very alkaline solution and that can actually deactivate the dopamine, making it not effective for our patients. Lastly, we're moving on to our epinephrine. It is an alternative drug of choice when it comes to symptomatic sinus bradycardia in place of dopamine when it's contraindicated. So we use this when we're pacing the patient, the atropine fails, and we're starting to have severe hypotension. So for dosing, it's going to be between 2 to 10 micrograms per minute, and we're going to titrate based on that patient's hemodynamics, that blood pressure. We want to titrate that slowly. So epinephrine considerations, rising blood pressure with increasing heart rate could cause angina, myocardial ischemia, and an increase in oxygen demand. So we have to monitor these people very closely. High doses does not improve survival rates. It may contribute to post-resuscitation myocardial dysfunction with poor neurological outcomes. If we have a patient who has been poisoned or is in a drug-induced shock, higher doses may be necessary to make this medication effective. I hope that this video was helpful in elevating your cardiac knowledge and helping you pass those exams like a boss. Make sure that you check out my website at www.nursechung.com where you can get copies of these resources, the PowerPoints, as well as test questions that I will be including with each one of these videos within the series. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions and make sure you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe and make sure you turn on that notification bell. Until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I can't wait to see you all again soon. Bye.